How to survive in war. The first step, have a lot of luck, fate, or whatever else you want to call it. Considering that a rifle 200 meters away only has to move a couple millimeters in order to shoot either on the ground or in your head, makes it that survival in war oftentimes comes down to luck. But besides that, there's a lot you can do to mitigate death or injury on the battlefield. So the first threat is small arms. So you're going to wear your plate armor on your vest, which is front, back, hopefully sides as well. And while you're wearing this armor, you're gonna face the enemy as you shoot. That way you're not tilted towards the enemy, you expose your side and you can sh get shot in the heart still. So anytime we train, we train to face the enemy as we fire. The next one is going into prone. Going into prone is gonna fix most of your problems. It's only the width and height of your head that should be exposed to the enemy. Whereas if you're standing, you're a bigger target. This should be obvious, but it's much more difficult even for a sniper to hit a target that's just this small. Finding cover. This is incredibly important. We've all played FPSs. Find yourself a piece of cover. Make sure that during patrols, if you're expecting an attack, you know exactly where you're going to go if the first shot rings out right then. And sometimes that cover is going to be micro terrain. Micro terrain is this miniature divots in the ground. It's something that you can often only see when you lay down. As soon as you hit the dirt, even an open field like Ukraine, you're going to find a lot of cover whether it's just an inch or two of ground. It's especially important when it comes to explosives, which we're getting into next. But the last point is suppression. Before you go to cover, we are trained RTR, return fire, take cover, return accurate fire. The return fire portion is not meant to hit the enemy, it is meant to suppress. And when you suppress the enemy, they're gonna put their heads down sometimes, and they're just overall gonna be less accurate. You can see videos of people shooting over berms uh, without actually aiming down their sight. So you switch the engagement from being a chicken shoot to an actual engagement. As soon as you fire a couple shots in their direction, suppression saves you. Now, moving on to artillery, mortars, RPGs, grenade launchers, pretty much anything explosive. Now, instead of the hard armor coming into play, we're going to look at soft armor. So soft armor inserts underneath your plate armor is really going to help seal the deal when it comes to protecting your body and your vital organs, but also pelvic armor. That's something that I'm a big believer in. Wearing pelvic armor is going to protect two main arteries that go down your legs, as well as the bones of your pelvis, which are very fragile. We also wear a Kevlar helmet. Kevlar helmets do not stop bullets. 5.56 five, can go straight through one end, go out the other. It might deflect it a bit. But Kevlar armor is really going to help when it comes to shrapnel, especially smaller shrapnel from mortars or grenades or such. And dispersion. Dispersion is going to be something I say for all of these. Spacing yourself out. It's going to prevent a mass casualty scenario. And it might seem counterintuitive because now a single artillery round has a greater chance of injuring somebody because we're so spread out. But staying spread out prevents a mass casualty scenario, which is what we're trying to avoid. Having two guys down in a squad but able to be treated and evacuated is better than half the squad going down. And now you can't treat some people in time and your security is down because everybody has to help the wounded and the mission is suddenly and abruptly ended. Going prone. Explosives, especially when they detonate on the ground, are going to orient upwards. If you are prone, you can be much closer to these even larger explosives, like 152 millimeter shells that are landing very, very close to your trench. Just because you're a little bit lower than the artillery shell, you could survive two meters away. We've seen videos of this. And that brings us into the next thing, finding subterranean structures. So basements, trenches, dugouts, anything that's underneath the ground is gonna help you a lot. You can be a lot closer and they have to almost directly hit you with that explosive in order to kill you or injure you. So stay low, literally, and that's that's gonna be your best bet. As well as the idea of cover. Always seek cover, especially when there's indirect fire coming in. The next one is distinguishing the sounds of incoming and outgoing. This is Something you can only have by experience in the battlefield, exposure to these different types of weapons. But after a little bit on the front line, I know from first-hand experience, just a month in, you'll be able to distinguish most of the sounds, and it can oftentimes keep you alive. Changing patrol routes if possible, good camouflage, and in general, avoiding detection from drones. We're going to be talking about drones here in a little bit, but changing our routes isn't just to confuse the enemy. It is also because there are things called TRPs, target reference points, and this is specific locations that are already coordinated for artillery, for these drones, for whatever. Whatever. So when a drone observes you, hopefully you have good camouflage so it doesn't, but if it does observe you and it calls in artillery, if you're not on that intersection, if you're not on that road next to that very identifiable feature that they already marked, they're going to have to start bracketing you. So it's going to give you a couple minutes to find better cover, whereas if you're walking on that well-trodden path, you're going to have a, a much worse time. They might even hit you on the first round. And obviously micro-terrain, if you go prone and you're in an open field, even just a couple inches of dirt, that can really, really help you, especially when it comes to these radius type weapons. How do we deal with drones on the battlefield? Well, all of your armor comes into play. The Kevlar helmet, we have the hard armor, the soft armor, and especially the pelvic armor. It's something that I don't really see 
on many soldiers, I think it's incredibly useful. But some of the things I've seen on the front line, as well as some of my friends are saying, are that the solutions we're creating to deal with FPVs, or these grenades dropped by drones, is just to have a thick blanket door in front of your dugout. That way the FPV slams into it, it can't go all the way down in your basement or wherever you are. And it just gives you that much extra room to be away from that explosive. So having that, or maybe just a thin wire mesh in front of your dugout, it's gonna stop these FPVs in their tracks maybe not even detonate. So that's a big one. Jamming guns, this is something I've seen personally, it's something that is still used to this day. It's gonna jam the radio frequency of those drones from the operator, as well as jamming backpacks. And I think that's gonna be the future when we look at, especially these NATO militaries going into trench warfare, if they ever were to. Jamming backpacks, something I was trained for in the Marine Corps about eight years ago. We had something called a Thor, and it was about a 20 kilo backpack, you wear it, and it's a jammer. So anything in, I think in a 50 meter radius, it's gonna block any of the signals in a specific range. And it was specifically for remote controlled IEDs. And it worked very, very well. We have those on vehicles, and I think that's gonna be the future. If we wear jamming backpacks, it's gonna make any FPVs within a 50 meter bubble of you uh, lose accuracy. They're not gonna be able to get that pinpoint accuracy and fly into your dugout. If you have that thing set up just in your trench system, not even on your person, I think it could help quite a bit. I think that's gonna be the future. Or if you're able to, you can operate in an area that already has a high level jammer, which has a radius of maybe even three kilometers, that's gonna prevent any of these drones from coming even near you. Going subterranean is gonna help you a lot as well. Again, these are dropping grenades. They're dropping RPGs or yeah, just explosives. They don't have guns on them yet. And the most important thing, in my opinion, is avoiding detection. So don't take the, the tracks that they're gonna be watching. They only have a certain amount of battery life. They only have a certain level of optics and zoom. So take the routes that are camouflaged. Take the routes that they don't expect you to. They're usually not gonna be focusing on the middle of a field where they don't think you're gonna be going. So it's just something to think about, as well as shotguns and drone guards. So something that I think NATO militaries are going to incorporate, we already see Ukraine doing this, is having drone guards in their squad. So say a squad is patrolling down, they hear a drone. Everybody drops face down into a piece of cover and lays still, because movement is what the drones see. And then a drone guard can put a scarf over his head, which is gonna help him avoid detection. He's looking up to the sky with an oily face, with two eyes. It's, it's very noticeable from the sky, even from jets way up in the sky. And say he has a shotgun, which allows him to be a little bit less accurate, birdshot or buckshot. You guys know and love Arnie. He was doing a drone mission about a year ago. He came back with this drone after uh, they were shooting at him, but he didn't think he was hit. And his propeller had a bullet hole straight through it, but he was still able to, to come back. I've crashed my drone, no problem. I think it's really important that we have a shotgun because we're just not gonna be accurate sometimes, especially with these FPVs, to fire directly into the CPU or whatever's powering it. Again, these are explosives, so go prone, uh, look for micro terrain, look for pieces of cover. And one of the top tips for this one, have cross training with a actual drone operator. You should have one within your platoon or at least your company level. Have a, uh, a quick one hour hit bucket class with how he detects Russian soldiers, how he finds them, how he targets them. And from that information, you can carry it with you and change out your gear a little bit. You can change up your camouflage or uh, change how you react to drones just by an hour of talking to some of these guys. The next one is mines. This is the most difficult one, but there's a lot of different types of mines. There's anti-personnel, anti-tank, there's booby traps. Some of the systems we can use to, to deal with this are mine clearing vehicles or handheld mine sweeping systems. But the top one is movement in a ranger file, going in a single file line. That way you're following in the footsteps. We can see this in videos where Russians are going in giant columns towards Avdivka. They all end up getting destroyed, but the lead vehicle gets hit by mine. Everybody else is alive still, but they orient off. They, they panic, they orient off that ranger file and they all blow up from mines. So staying in that one single track is really gonna help you. But in general, you wanna avoid certain areas. You wanna watch out for signaling structures. It's like a building on the side of a road, an intersection. You wanna avoid these things or at least be very careful. This is where you're, they're gonna plant mines. When I was in the Marine Corps, they taught us something very, very important that I, I kept with me through all these different war zones, which is take the path of most resistance. Take the path that they don't think you would ever go down because that's where they're not gonna plant mines. That's not where they're gonna plant ambushes. That's not where they're gonna be looking with a drone. They don't believe you're gonna go through there. So go through there. Another way to survive this is when you are doing patrols, maybe a routine patrol, maybe you're just going to and from a location, you should mark those mines, at least with a GPS coordinate, give it to a commander, and even before going on a mission, you should ask the commanders, are there any mines in the area? 
Oftentimes they'll tell you where these mines are, where they have suspected mines, what kind of mines. All this information is extremely valuable, but nothing is more valuable than dispersion. Mass casualty scenarios are the worst thing in the world. You do not want to get into that situation. So disperse yourself. If somebody loses a leg from a mine, you're going to have to have two guys carry them at least. But if you have two guys down, now you have six guys down. You know what I mean? And beyond mines, we have fixed wing and rotary aircraft. In general, fixed wing are gonna be dropping bombs and helicopters will use both guided missiles, unguided rockets, and even a gun. The training guy that I got from the Marines is honestly terrible. It's very outdated where they say to lay vertical to a jet because of strafing runs and horizontal for a helicopter for some other reason. But from Iraq and Ukraine, I learned quite a bit. And our reaction was largely based off of staying away from valuable targets. If they know where your base is, you want to stay away from that if there's a jet in the area. In general, these jets are not able to get too close to the front line because of stingers and iglas and, and strellas, which are another factor. So they're going to stay away from the battlefield. They're not going to be observing. They're just going to be launching these bombs on pre-designated targets that the drone found for them, that the the intel on the ground found for them. Make sure to camouflage the vehicles and expensive equipment. Again, dispersion, incredibly important. And also something you might not think about, stay in the lower levels. If you're in a building, if you're on the roof, that's where the missile is going to hit. They're not going to hit the basement. They're not going to hit the first level. It's going to be hitting on top, especially when, the, when it comes to artillery. And this moves us into cruise missiles and Shahids. These are combined with other aerial threats, but various anti-air systems are in place in the rear to intercept them. Infantry don't usually have anything to worry about this, but good OPSEC and good camouflage, having a good NCO core that says, hey, don't stay outside too long. Hey, get your cigarette in the trash. Don't throw it out. You don't want people to know where you're living. You, you don't want them to think that it's important because if it's important, they're going to bomb it. So use camouflage netting. Don't throw trash everywhere. And again, stay in the lower levels, subterranean if possible. Just disperse, disperse. Take some BMPs. We all know how to deal with those things. Rockets, missiles, we have javelins, and laws. We have all these different things, mines, and even FPVs are extremely effective. So these tanks and BMPs are well known on how to destroy them. Just make sure that you have cross training in each of these weapon systems. Everybody in the squad should know how to use every weapon system. In my opinion, it takes about five minutes to know how to operate the javelin. It takes about five minutes to learn how to use the end lock. All these systems can be learned. And if you train just an hour a day on each of these things in a week, everybody should know how to use these weapon systems at the very basic knowledge. Again, we're dealing with explosives largely. So dispersion, going prone when you know that they're near, when they're firing at you and going subterranean, having trenches, having these dugouts in these trench systems, you're going to have freedom of movement where the tank doesn't have eyes on you as you're moving. So then you can have the assault men flank a little bit, get a nice side hit on it. it. There's all sorts of different ways to deal with it. And I'm not gonna talk about it too much because this is a land-based target. Land-based targets are what the infantry are made for. They all have weapon systems to deal with these things. And it's something that every infantryman should be trained on. Oftentimes with all the threats that I mentioned here, the most important thing is to not be observed. Have good camouflage, have a good drone guard because what's gonna observe you isn't usually gonna be the forward observer. It is going to be a drone. These things are everywhere. They are looking for you. They have good optics. But at the end of the day, we made those optics. We made those drones. We made the weapon systems to take them on. And we made the training and the protocols to deal with these things. Humans are a lot smarter and we can find solutions to deal with anything as we learned here today. So make it harder to distinguish how many of you there are, what your capabilities are, and what routes you take. All these things come into play when it comes to avoiding detection. So all in all, from what I can tell, there are three vital things that you need to keep in mind to survive on the battlefield. The first one is working in small recon teams before an assault. So if you're going to be assaulting an objective, you need to have some intelligence on it. You have to gain some on the ground info and you shouldn't be sending a platoon out there. You should send three to four man teams. Why? Because it's not going to trigger an immense response. And it's also not going to trigger a buildup of forces that are expecting a, a large attack. It's harder to locate and hard to dedicate large amounts of munitions on a three to four man team during a patrol rather than 30 guys and you know two BMPs. The second, having basic infantryman training. Knowing the weapon systems, how they work in the grand scheme of things, and knowing what the mission is before going on it so the momentum is held as you conduct that mission. Dispersion, camouflage, going prone, communication. All these things come into play and it's something you can do in two months. I think two months for somebody who has a lot of morale can learn pretty much everything he needs to know to get to the battlefield and survive his first couple engagements before he gains that exposure to the battlefield and uh, knows the sounds and how to deal with different threats. This is going to keep him alive up until then. And that is why I consider that extremely vital. And the third one is a good NCO core to instill discipline. Complacency is the biggest threat, more so than the tanks, more so than the jets and drones. 
complacency yourself and how you act on the battlefield is the greatest threat to everybody around you, including yourself. So it is the sergeant's job to give you the discipline to survive. To survive is not fun. It is not something that's enjoyable. A lot of times you feel like dying when you're on patrol, when you're in this trench system. The sergeant needs to make sure that you're not throwing trash everywhere. You are putting on good camouflage. You're keeping your weapon clean. You're, you're not staying outdoors when you hear that drone go over you for the millionth time, having OPSEC accounted for, and the soldier's morale high and prepared and trained for the next mission. Also Faraday bags. Faraday bags are gonna block any communication that you have on your phone. So I would definitely recommend a Faraday bag, at least one in every team, but everybody can have one. It's kind of inexpensive. You can make it yourself as well. You can have it as your dump pouch. Because look, soldiers don't see everything around them. There's a million things that are invisible to us as humans. There's infrared imaging that we can't see. There's these drones that have optics that can zoom in super close. There's radio frequencies. All these things are happening around that soldiers can't see. So you can't blame these soldiers who aren't the, aren't the brightest bunch to know what's happening around them invisibly. Have Faraday bags anytime that you don't need to use your phone. Hey, phone in the Faraday bag. Let's get that signal out of there. That way you're not gonna be tracked as well. Optic is gonna be better. You're not gonna be targeted by all sorts of munitions because they know exactly where you are if you bring your phone. It's just something I, I wanna mention. Oh, and another big one, it's a given. Tourniquets, bandages, training on each of them. Because again, luck, fate, anything you wanna call it, that is what's going to determine if you survive or not a lot of times. Almost every friend that I know out there that's been there two years has been hit. There's simply nothing you can do at times. The job is dirty, it's dangerous, and you will get hit if you do the job long enough. Knowing medical skills is vital. So to end this all, the threats are gonna change. Uh, there's always gonna be new systems and new revolutionary breakthroughs to kill humans. Always will be, always have been. But as the instructor I had for Minds in the YPG five years ago told me, the human brain created all these things. All these millions of dollars of equipment that is targeting you, we made it, the human mind. And we can find the solution. We can figure it out. The human mind is the most powerful weapon. It's something you need to keep in mind. Never let go of your intuition. Never let go of your intelligence and what you can bring to the table, no matter who you are. If you have enough morale, enough knowledge, and enough grit to fix problems, you will find a solution. So if I missed anything, let me know down in the comments. If you have any ideas, I'm willing to listen to it. Put in the comments. I, I'm very curious what we can come up with. We have all seen the horrors of war, either in person or online. And as we learned here today, there are a million ways to mitigate these threats. So I hope you enjoyed watching the video. I hope you learned something. I'll talk to you guys in the next one. Peace.